There we go. Well, welcome everyone to um, the World's View Academy OD Talks. Um, it's good to see some of the regular faces and some new names. Um, welcome. Um, thank you for joining our community. The, the, we're trying to build and empower a global OD community through these OD Talks. Um, and a little bit about us as, as a business, World's View Academy, is we're a specialist OD firm and place of higher learning. And we help organizations become more effective in a healthy way. And we do that through first class OD training, group developments, um, group development interventions from team all the way through to leadership and boards, and then into uh, issue centric OD consulting and process consulting. So th those are our, our main weapons in helping individuals, groups and organizations to be more effective in a healthy way. And um, what, one, of, one of the things that we love to do as a business is build and, and empower um, an OD community. And right now, um, diversity and resilience is one of the, 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 the topical things that organizations are you know, asking themselves and wanting to build to be more effective in a healthy way. And um, our conversation this morning is with Sharon Shakung and Lucille Griev, both um, members of our, our OD community. Lucille has been part of the community for a very, very long time. And Lucille, um, I read your bio on LinkedIn this morning, and there are so many things, you know, the, the laughter workshops, that was amazing. Um, but first and foremost, you are really, 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 excellent in the work of leadership maturity and fallback, diversity and inclusion, and work with the Enneagram. So I think the, the, the contribution to this, this talk is gonna be phenomenal and thank you for joining us. And Sharon, um, your work in value-based leadership, personal mastery, um, diversity and inclusion, and culture change, being a um, management consultant and coach for more than 20 years, Thank you for joining our, um, our conversation this morning, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, before I hand over to Lucille, just some, some practical things. For those of you who are new to Zoom, um, at the bottom of your window, there's a chat functionality. Um, it's a, a speech bubble. If you wanna ask some questions, just pop your question in the chat and we'll be monitoring that. Um, and then there'll be time for Q&A. The session is recorded. Um, please keep yourself on mute and um, raise your hand if you want to have a chat or, in, or engage. And if this is something that um, resonates with you and your needs, um, stick around till the end so that you can have a chat with us and we'll see if we can uh, add more value to your lives. So thank you everyone for joining and um, I'll hand over to Lucille and Sharon. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Roy. Um, and my role today is um, mostly here to facilitate the conversation with Sharon on behalf of all of us. So know that I'll be keeping an eye on the chat box, any questions that you have or contributions that, that you want to make into the conversation, please do that there. I think I would be amiss if we do not start this conversation just with a recognition of the context that we're having it in. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll kick off into the depth of it. So we are in the midst of, uh, what's it, three months into lockdown more or less uh, in South Africa in the space of our um, number of COVID-19 positive cases and also the number of deaths rising steadily at the moment so we're we're definitely not out of the woods from a health perspective or an economic and social perspective but at the same time this is also happening and we're having this conversation at a time where the spotlight is definitely on issues of race and systemic racism and systemic discrimination um, 
the death of George Floyd in the US has had an unprecedented impact globally. I don't think I've in, in the last 20 years lived through something that has spread the conversation about what does it mean to be a person living in a, in a black body and a person living in a white body. Um, and also the relationship with uh, the blue bodies, uh, the police and people in authority and people with power and how that works. So I just want to recognize that context and recognize that systemic racism in South Africa um, is definitely something that we need to acknowledge and, and that has um, a relationship with what's happening in America, but also that we have our own complex set of circumstances and deeply entrenched um, systemic racism in South Africa. And that, that needs to be the acknowledgement and starting point for this conversation if we want to have it in a way that makes sense. And, um, and, and that's just maybe important for us to hold as we talk and think about this. So Sharon, I am very excited to be interviewing you today and for us to be talking about these important um, topics of diversity and inclusion, how it relates to re resilience and also how it relates to uh, the broader field of understanding the complexity of the issues involved here. So um, welcome to, to OD Talk and I think it's high time that we talk about this. Yeah, hello and thank you very much. Good morning everybody. I'm really happy to be here and hoping that it's going to be a conversation that's worth your while. Um, and, and I just want to just close up front that I am no expert. <laughs> I do not have um, any monopoly on any of these issues um, and all the contributions that I'm going to make um, will be based on obviously learning from other people, learning from people who um, live in these spaces full time, who have done research over many years, um, also based on my own personal experiences, um, you know, with all of the diversity dimensions that I live on a day to day basis. So, um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to also hearing from, from you yourselves um, in this space and, and also from, you know, learning from you if, if anybody has um, anything to share, you know, a different perspective, because we might be, or I might say something that somebody in the room is in absolute and complete disagreement with, please do speak up um, in the chat. That, that's how we learn. We don't learn by all, you know, saying the same thing and agreeing about everything, etc. We will not move on. So, um, so let's all be open to learning, and I'm also open to learning myself. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sharon. And so I guess as a starting point, um, maybe just tell us a little bit more about the journey in the conversation you want to take us on. Um, what are we talking about here today? And also why do these things matter to you? Why are they important to you uh, personally? And how have you come to think and work uh, in, in this broader field and in these topics we'll be covering? Mm -hmm. um, Lucille, I think besides the almost like broader scope um, reasons for wanting to get involved in the space, um, I mean, the globe has uh, challenges to do with diversity they've had for centuries. And I think many of us want to do something about that. You know, many of us want to, to see much of this um, ending, you know, whether that's idealistic or not, um, I don't know. But I think I'm not the only one who um, feels this sense within to want to do something about this and, and, and see things changing. But besides that, on a more personal level, I've had um, a very interesting life from a diversity perspective. Starting from when I was growing up um, in the 80s, I had a life experience that I am still looking for other people who might have had a similar life experience just to to share and see if maybe I'm not alone in this. And the experience that I had back then was that I was living in the township and, um, and I think we all know what was happening in the mid to late 80s um, in the townships in our country, uh, which means that I was in the middle of that. Um, and while being in the middle of that, the, the interesting um, aspect of my life that was 
very different from everybody else in my age group in the same living environment was that I was um, a student, a pupil in those days, that's what it was called, not a learner. <laughs> I was a pupil, a high school pupil um, in the, we didn't call them the suburbs in those days. Um, we called it Kotropo, <laughs> which literally means in town, right? So I was a student at a, at a convent, which was, um, and again, in those days, we didn't say uh, whatever open model C, whatever it's called, we used to say multiracial, right? So I was a student at a multiracial high school in Krugersdorp. Um, and, and I was living two lives in a way, because on the one hand, I was smack in the middle of the AT space. And, and for those of you in the room who know what that looked and felt like, um, it included things like people being burned with um, tires around their necks. It included um, mothers coming back from town, having bought groceries and being fed those groceries with fish oil and powder soap being shoved down their throats, literally. Um, it included something that I experienced firsthand, which was the bombing of homes that were seen to be, we were called targets. Um, if you're, you were either a comrade or you were a target. And with my family and my home, we were seen as targets because I was going to an all-white school. And I'm saying all-white school because in the four years that I spent in that school with 160 students, only four of us were black. So I was the only black kid in the class, right? So I had that experience at home in the township, one of which included our home being petrol bombed and I was at home with my mom on that day and us managing to stop the fire before it actually uh, burnt up the, the whole house. Then on the other hand, I would go at the very same time, go to the school, which was a completely different world, completely different world. I, I don't need to describe it. We all, we all South African, many of us in the room are South African. So we know what we mean. Um, privileged, elite, beautiful gardens, serene, very small school, like I said, imagine a whole high school having only 160 kids. Um, yeah, completely different world. And being the one of four blacks in the school, being one of no other <laughs> black child in the class, almost not seen, not heard, not acknowledged, um, just accepted because you were there. And by the way, how I got there, was um, that my primary school, also being Catholic, the head of that school was a nun who lived at, let's call it the other school for now. And she's the one who facilitated my being a student there. So I wasn't paying full fees because obviously my parents couldn't, couldn't afford that. So it was almost like being done a favor to be there, but because you're being done a favor, you're just there. You're literally just there, but you're not, you're not really there. <laughs> so, so I had a whole bunch of experiences there, which which disturbed me and, and got me to ask the question, what is going on here? I don't understand. And as I was getting older and learning a little bit more about what was happening in my country and I got to varsity and so on, my whole space opened up and I thought, no, <laughs> this can't be right. I have to find a way of being a role player in fixing this in my own little mind. So fast forward a um, couple of years ago when diversity training started in businesses. Again, I picked up something that just wasn't okay with it. It, was, it didn't feel right for me to hear diversity training. I thought, how can you train people to become different? You know, and this was many, many years ago, early on in my career. So for years, I stayed away from this space, but I, felt, I still felt this very strong almost like push or maybe pull to look at it more positively. That said, Sharon, you've got to do something in this space. You've got to do something about this. And so I looked for a way in which I could play a role. Um, and I came up with my own approach to, yes, it's still called diversity training. Um, I might rather say a diversity learning program or just diversity program or diversity conversation. And I came up with a way that um, left my soul a little bit more at peace because the way in which I approach it, for me, it feels like it's not superficial, which is something I picked up in, in the other programs. It was more like a tick box. You know, we are 
BP or whoever, we've done diversity trainings. Uh, we are Starbucks. <laughs> Fast forward to the more recent future, we've done diversity training. Um, we have taught people how to greet in Setswana, which is my home language. Take, you know, uh, we've taken a trip to the, the, the hood or the township. Take, I just, yeah, I didn't want to get involved in that. And, and I've come up now with a way in which I hope um, is a little bit deeper and does make a difference. Mm. Thank you so much for, for sharing part of your story, Sharon, and um, I hear it and I acknowledge it in this point in time. And it's so interesting that it starts from your experience in high school. Uh, and given what's happening in the world today, I'm so aware of how many of the high schools, especially the priv privileged high schools, are deep in conversation around how some of those dynamics are still playing out. And maybe the numbers look different of how many black children are in some of these former uh, all-white schools. But the conversation is, is so topical and there's so much going on around it. And what strikes me is, uh, as a mother of a high school student myself, that a lot of the conversations around diversity at a school level at the moment, uh, the kids are kicking out the adults. And um, I know of many schools where groups are getting together and saying, we want to have our own conversations uh, around this. And we would like the adults to leave the room because you guys actually aren't helping us um, mm. uh, and are actually dragging us back into ideas uh, around diversity and inclusion. That's more about tolerance and accommodation where we're really interested in each other's lived experiences. Mm. Um, so I know at my son's high school, um, the grade 12s recently did their own learning orientation day and said, teachers, you're out of here. We're going to talk about racism and what it looks like in our school. Um, and and that, that seems to be changing the conversation in a way uh, that I'm quite proud of, a younger generation that's not on, on this call. Um, so let's talk a bit more about uh, diversity and maybe start from there. Uh, what we have such different understandings of diversity and I know one of the people in this field that I really um, admire uh, he's a, a trauma uh, therapist in the US called Resma Menachem he normally starts his talks by saying who of you work with diversity and inclusion gets people to put up their hands and then his next question is to say so just answer this question without taking down your hand diverse from what uh, which is such a provocative perspective if we think about our humanity and our shared humanity so what diverse from the norm and the norm that's been established as a as a white norm or diverse from what so what do you understand and when you work with diversity and inclusion what are you working with what are you talking about and and what does this mean to you mm -hmm. yeah thanks for that Lucille um yeah, I, I, I smiled at that question, diverse from what? Um, because, yeah, that, that's a powerful question. Uh, my, my view of diversity is, is, is as follows. First of all, life is diverse. Um, so it's a natural phenomenon. It's, it's, it's actually so natural that we shouldn't be having a problem with it, um, we, but we somehow do because we construct those problems. Life is diverse and it's, it's healthier that way. It's, it's more natural that way and it's healthier that way. Um, I mean, if we shift from people for a moment and just look at the rest of life without the people, it's diverse and it's rich in its diversity, right? And, and that's what makes it life. That's what makes it good and healthy and that's what makes it prosper. That's what makes it resilient, which we're gonna come to later because you need diversity for resilience. Um, that's, what, that's what makes it do more than survive, but thrive. And, and the same principles apply to us as people. We are diverse and we are richer in our diversity and we need the diversity. And that diversity is what will actually make us do more than just survive, but thrive, right? But what we do as people is we take away from that diversity. But let me, let me not go there as yet and, and just say what my very basic and simple definition of, of diversity is. And I actually wrote it down. Um, for me, diversity is the differences that we have amongst us as people, right? That make us unique as individuals and help us thrive as communities. 
So that, that's my, my simplest. Um, if I may repeat it just for my own brain sake, sorry guys, I, I hope it benefits you too. <laughs> but it's the differences that we have amongst us as people. I mean, just look at this room that we're in right now. So many differences, you can't even count them if we actually extend uh, beyond race and gender and you know the usual culprits, right? So many differences that we have amongst us as people. And those differences make us both unique as individuals and richer and stronger and more, dare I use the word prosperous, it came to mind, as communities. Mm. Mm. That's such a beautiful, beautiful definition. And what I really like about it is that it, it does speak into, into the richness of difference between us. And I do think that um, that a lot of the conversation around around diversity, and it's it's important to start there, <laughs> and it's tricky to start there. But often we start at race, uh, except if we're white women, then we often start with uh, gender, right? Uh, so <laughs> so we start from race, and, race and gender, and and. And often that's where the conversation ends. And as you say, if we look at the full spectrum of diversity, there is so many aspects of that represented just in this room that sticking to those two labels is the starting point and the end point at the same time is, um, is potentially problematic. And yet the size of the, the race issue uh, globally is also so big that, um, yeah, I think that's probably one of the spaces where, where we least versed in how to have sensible conversations that, um, that take us forward into, into that prosperous future. Um, and it's the place where people most often feel ashamed, walk on eggshells, don't know where to uh, where to start, where to end, and uh, uh, and there's there's many ways of shutting that conversation down. Some of them quite obvious, and some of them quite um, quite uh, skilled and maybe unconscious. Um, so how how in your practice and your work, and I know that a lot of the time the way in which you bring issues of diversity into the conversation is as part of broader leadership development, as opposed to a standalone, um, standalone topic in some way. It's part of a broader leadership development uh, or development process. Tell us a bit more about what you, how you approach these things and what you've, what you've learned over the years in terms of what works and what doesn't work when, when dealing with diversity and inclusion um, within that broader development discussion? Mm -hmm. Well, Lucille, I think the first thing for me is to um, not isolate the race conversation. Um, what, what I find works better is if in our engagements, we talk about or we, we create an understanding of diversity in its broader sense, so that we can see that the race element Yes, it might be, you know, very um, uh, much bigger than the others in terms of how we engage that particular dimension, et cetera. But I think if we, if we do that and almost like contextualize the race dimension amongst all of the others and create a broader understanding of diversity and all of the dimensions that are involved, um, it helps the race conversation because when you are dealing with each of these different dimensions, and the way you approach, for example, um, engagements around sexual orientation, uh, engagements around um, mental health, uh, for example, or ability, mental ability, physical ability, and all of those things, it helps you to then have the conversation about the race dimension in a way that becomes less personal, in a way that, that doesn't, um, get people to become defensive um, or overly emotional, it takes that away, but it doesn't take away from the substance of the conversation itself. Um, and, and if I may, I mean, let, let's, let's go through those dimensions right now anyway, and there are many. So even the ones that we're going to list uh, right now are not exhaustive by, by, by any means. 
so so let let's say the differences that we have we have race racial differences differences in race in culture ethnicity language gender religion ability sexual orientation socioeconomic status level of education etc but then we also have and this also helps in the in the in the race conversation and and the other uh, diversity conversations as well that we also have differences for example in, in personal beliefs as individuals, beliefs about ourselves, beliefs about other people, about life and the world in, in general, the, the world around us, uh, differences in personal values, in what motivates us, in the kinds of goals and dreams and aspirations that we have. So, so when, you, when you broaden the diversity spectrum to that, it very, very much so helps with um, the race conversation, with the gender conversation. Um, and, and all of these other conversations that, that we find very, very challenging. So, um, so, so, so in my work, I have found that one of the things that happens is um, that people feel threatened, um, that people feel exposed. Sometimes they feel like they don't know enough and, and therefore they are afraid to have the conversation or they're afraid to, you know, they feel that um, whatever beliefs they have or whatever knowledge they have is so different from everybody else's or the knowledge is lacking to some extent. So, so they become afraid to do that. They also become afraid to offend uh, in being part of that conversation. So, so when, you, when you're having that conversation, you need to very much so hold that space um, within a frame that says, you know what, you actually matter so terribly much as an individual. It doesn't matter how different you are in your thinking, in your knowledge, in your whatever it might be, you matter as an individual. And we have, or at least as, as, as the person facilitating the conversation, I have equal regard for you as I do for everybody else in the room who is different from you. So, so the space that, that you have um, is a space of safety and it's a space in which you are fully acknowledged, regardless of whether you actually believe there is nothing wrong with the keyword or not. And I've had those discussions. I've had very meaningful, very positive, very fruitful, constructive learning engagements with people, for example, or there's one in particular that I'm thinking of in one of my engagements, who actually believed that that's what he knew, that's what he believed. And we had to talk about beliefs, we had to talk about knowledge, we had to talk about intercultural engagements and so on. And, and this person's starting point when the engagement started was that he absolutely sees nothing wrong with the K word. But the space was so positive and safe for him that he could express that and that fear wasn't there. And we managed to have a very meaningful engagement throughout the course of that day. Mm. That, that sounds um, and, and probably speaks to your skill in setting up uh, psychological safety. Uh, which is one of the, the important things that help us get into constructive conversations around that. Um, uh, and these, these uh, quite radical topics, I mean, just thinking uh, of the kind of space that needs to be safe enough for that conversation to take place. Um, I take my hat off to you. And I also know that that probably means that you do a lot of internal work to keep holding space when you get into tricky territory like that, uh, which brings us back to the, the organization development practitioner's competence around the self as instrument. If my self as instrument is not getting attention, the chances of me getting triggered in that conversation and breaking down all the psychological safety is, is, is quite big. Um, mm -hmm. So my hat's off to you uh, in terms of that. Um, in my own work, I know part of what, what I find helpful and, and just as a uh, maybe a contribution to add to what you're saying is often we start our work working with something like the Enneagram that allows us to think about personal beliefs and motivations to also realign who we see as similar and different because if we just go into the diversity conversation the 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 differences and similarities that are foregrounded are the obvious ones like uh, my race like my gender and my experience and my language in some way, seniority. But if we realign people to realize that, you know, these three people who on the outside look very different actually have similar um, unconscious programmings, 
the conversation seems to get safer as well. So I really get what you're, you're saying around that. Um, at the same time, I want to offer a provocation. I don't know um, mm -hmm. that I've, that I've come across in, in some of my work. Um, and I'd love to hear how you work with that. And specifically, uh, this is happening more and more in some of the deeply contested spaces like the university settings, etc. So there, um, in one of the universities where I've worked quite a lot with the, the office that's responsible for transformation, they see their role as people that are kind of the, the caretakers of the diversity conversation as being one of aligning with students and provoking the system into change exclusively. They've said to me, we are not interested in not going at this directly, strongly and fiercely um, as a way of aligning ourselves with the student agenda. And, um, and it's a very different approach to the one that you're talking about here. So what are your thoughts ar around that part of the conversation, which is restitution before healing? Mm -hmm. um in some way and uh you know i know one of the one of the the conversations that's kind of an and language that's sparked by the black lives matter protests in the u.s has to do with justice and peace and how you relate to those which has to come first how how does this work so just your thoughts mm -hmm. on on that uh part of the complexity yeah um, look, I think we'll, we will all have different approaches to reaching what is hopefully a common vision, right? And I think there are merits in each of those different approaches. I don't believe that there is one approach that is the only one that can and will work. So, so I am open to other practitioners and other individuals and other you know, leaders out there um, wanting to approach their challenge in a particular way and as long as they know the pros and cons of it and we're aiming towards the same end, um, end point that's okay but the approach that i prefer um, which i have used both in my in my professional life and in my personal life to um to to work with issues of diversity is is actually the one that says let's let's aim for inner healing let's aim for um an inner reworking of our beliefs and values. Let's aim for um, educating ourselves as individuals within and using that knowledge to then co-create the, the, the you know, final vision that we want to achieve. Um, and, and I just want to share a screen here that, that talks a little bit to that. Just give me a second, let me get to the right place. Um, and this is something that I use quite a bit in in my work. So, so, so what I do um, when, when I use this, this model is I try and get people to see that whatever is happening on the outside, whatever we see um, in terms of both ourselves and other people around us in the form of the behaviors that we demonstrate, the interactions that we have with one another, the kinds of relationships that we have with one another and the outcomes of all of our actions and interactions and the impact that we have on one another as, as individuals and as communities and even within an organization. Um, if we see that as something that is influenced by and coming from whatever is happening in our inner world in the form of all of these things and more that we have on the diagram, that kind of engagement I have found actually reaches people at a very, very deep level and begins to facilitate change at that level. And I would much rather spend effort and energy doing that than almost like, and the word aggressive came to mind, um, than almost aggressively saying, okay, we're going to do whatever, 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 these are the actions that we're going to take and we'll do the healing afterwards. I suppose they, they work side by side. Um, I suppose, you know, those other sort of um, fundamental external reforms um, are absolutely necessary. I absolutely and completely agree. At the same time, we have to also be doing and working with and facilitating the inner work that people need to do in, in order for them to actually come to the party and help um, us achieve what these um, 
fundamental macro reforms are aiming to achieve because there's no point doing that when the persons themselves from within are actually not transforming. Mm. It strikes me that a lot of your work comes from a place that can only be described as loving. Um, and I don't know how that vocabulary lands for you, uh, but that's a deeply loving approach. And I really, I really appreciate the, the space of saying, how do we work with um, healing and reform at the same time in some way and make sure that we're doing the, the internal work so that the reforms in the external world is met by changed individuals. Um, but do you think of your work as relating to love? I laughed, um, Lucille, because for years I've been using that word in the corporate space and, um, and for years I've been getting very strange reactions <laughs> from people that I've, that I've worked with. Um, I remember a, a leadership session that I had once and, and, I mean, and it was mostly uh, uh, males in, in the room. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but they, they were literally laughing about this. They thought it was a joke until, of course, the engagement continued and they were like, okay, uh, we see how, in fact, we need to love <laughs> the people in our care as leaders in order for us to, um, to be able to actually be more effective leaders. And, and how we, just using that, that particular case as an example, how we went about it, I said to them, okay, rephrase or rather change the word love for care. Let's, let's, let's move into the care space. Do you really care? And I said, okay, let's change care to give a damn. Do you really give a damn about the people that are in your care? Do you really give a damn about the people in your team as humans, as people, as individuals with full lives, as individuals like yourself with fears and vulner vulnerabilities and goals and dreams and whatever it might be? Do you give a damn? And they said, well, yeah. I said, okay, which means you care, right? Yeah. Well, do you love <laughs> those people? Yeah, well, I, I guess I do. You know, so, so the acknowledgement as well. I, I think it's, there's this discomfort, um, especially in the corporate space and, 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 and anywhere else. I mean, it's, we, we, we almost like seem to have a fear of working from a place of love and acknowledging the fact that we are working from a place of love. And in my view, unless we do, not much of what we put in place by way of plans and strategies and goals and values, you know, I don't know how you can have values without love, but yes, all of those, not, not much of that stands a chance of actually achieving what we say we wanted to achieve. We, we say a lot, um, Lucille, about the kind of world we want to live in. We, we speak, we say so, so, so much. But when it comes to the doing, we, we don't actually support enough what we say. And, and we pay lip service to so very much of, of, of things that, that we should actually be respecting more. And I'm using these words quite deliberately, you know, the love and the respect. And, and when I say respect, when we, if we do not respect diversity, for example, it doesn't matter what intervention we put in place in pursuit of, I don't know how we will put it in that case, in pursuit of opportunities that diversity has to offer. We cannot do that if we do not regard one another in the same way. And, and this is, if you look at, at, at a hierarchy of an organization, a traditional hierarchy, if, if I as the leader at the top, do not, and I'm going to use the word again, we can rephrase it to whatever, <laughs> right? Do not love the people in my company and regard them as human beings with the same level of human dignity that I would like to be regarded with. We have a problem. Mm, that resonates so deeply with me and it takes me back to one of the maybe turning points in my own career as an organization development practitioner, and I'm going back 20, 20 odd years, where um, I was asked to um, work on a safety strategy for, uh, 
steel manufacturing organization and they wanted a very clever simulation and model that would in some way predict uh, disabling injuries and, and where the pressure points were. And I spent quite a lot of time building a model and then I had to go back to them and say, well, you know, we can simulate all we want, but the problem that we have here is that you have lots of people that work on the site that have become objectified and you just don't care enough about them. You don't mm -hmm. love the people and regardless of what signs you put up and what language and what people, unless you start loving the people that come onto the site and work in very dangerous conditions, you're actually going to be wasting your time. And it was an incredibly mm -hmm. unpopular moment, I think, in my consulting career with that organization. And it had some big repercussions. Um, but it's one of those, it's one of those transformative moments when we have the opportunity to see the way in which we objectify humans um, to become, you know, to use old language, cognitive a wheel or human resources. I mean, it's a funny thing. I have a problem with um, that word, human yeah. resources. Uh, we're, not, we're not quite resources, are we? We're human beings. And so I, I really resonate with, with this message and I know that it's really tricky to bring. And, and I know that in your work, there are other provocative messages that you bring when you talk about diversity. Um, uh, for example, talking about what it means to be an African um, and how that lands. And I know I have my own story as a, a white woman who's always lived in Africa around mm -hmm. the African. Uh, how do you work with concepts like that? Oh, yeah, the African one is, a, is another interesting one, um, you see, because for me, I think it's also um, a bit of an emotional one. Um, I know that you, you said, you know, in terms of facilitation skills, you need to be able to hold your space and, and so on. The African one is one that I find a little bit challenging for me personally, because um, I have observed and experienced how, and I've learned, you know, through studies and so on, how the, the, the and, and I'm even reluctant to call it concept, let's say the identity, yes, not concept of Africanism, the identity of, of being African, how it has actually not only been pushed into the back burner, but in it being pushed into the back burner, it has, it seems to be at the risk of losing meaning. Um, what we have as more prominent in this day and age is the racial identification. There's black, there's white, there's in South Africa, colored Indian, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, and race in itself, and that's another discussion for another day, I believe is a construct that um, was put forth by whoever, whenever, quite conveniently so, and given a hierarchy, you know, you have to be white to be 100% at the top and you're fully human and anything less is less than, right? And then in that hierarchy, black was then put at the very bottom in terms of recognition, acknowledgement, regard, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in that whole space, African has just almost like ceased to exist. Um, I remember in South Africa when we had those um, forms, the um, uh, Black Empowerment Triple BEE story, which again is another discussion for another day. Um, they used to have, I think, Black slash African, and then there were debates about what's Black, what's African, etc. But Africanism and Africanness, I would love to see being given its space in the philosophies that we use um, when we try and get a better understanding and grasp of what it is to be human, um, of what it is to even be a leader, because even in the leadership space, I've seen it over the you know, past 20 years, trying to get its place in their you know, African leadership philosophies. And then it you know, was almost like pushed aside by European, Western and Asian and everything else. So, so the identity of being African is one that I think, even as South Africans, we need to just stop and almost like turn to that space 
and play in that space. And I'm saying as South Africans because in South Africa, we're multicultural, right? We have the Africans and then we have everybody else. But I, I look forward to a time where, let's say, for example, somebody like yourself, a white South African woman identifying as African, or maybe even if they don't identify as African, recognizing the African identity and knowing what it means and working with it as another dimension of our diversity as a, as a community. Mm. Mm. And um, I think in, in my understanding, an African is, a, is part of the identity that I, that I work with for myself. But it's something to say, so for me at the heart of, of Africanism is the, the principle of liberation and liberation ethics as a starting point that comes with an African identity. And I know that some people are deeply offended by um, that part of my own identity. And at the same time, identity is such a core part of diversity and inclusion in some ways and and i guess part of part of the way in which i think about this is that if my own identity is quite narrow and um overly simplified if i don't have a very diverse identity inside me it really makes it very hard for me to meet the diversity out there in the world with anything that can be close to respect and love because whatever I repress inside me will also be what I oppress or um, cannot meet. I mean, there's many, many ways oppression is maybe strong language and it's important mm -hmm. language to work with uh, from a white perspective. But this idea of the richness of identity is, is something that um, is maybe the internal manifestation of diversity that then allows for resilience in some way. Mm. Mm, mm. No, absolutely, um, uh, Lucille. I was actually thinking along the same lines to, um, to say that the, the more we are not open to acknowledging and recognizing and working with diversity in its broadest sense with all of the richness that it offers, the less resilient we can actually be or become. I think, I think the challenge with, with, with diversity and, and all of the differences that, 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 we, that we recognize that we have, which are not necessarily bad, um, is where we use the differences to regard others as less than. So I am African and you're not, or you don't identify as African, so therefore you're less than. I am a male and you are a woman and therefore you're less than. I am white and you are not, so therefore you are less than. So, so I think, or I'm educated and you're not, so therefore you're less than. I'm rich, you're not, you know, and so it goes. So, so I, see, I see that as a very big part of the challenge where I then take my identity and use it to almost categorize you, classify you, rather regard you, yeah, that's best, as less than. Mm. And then, and then I, when I'm challenged on that, and, and I just want to share um, another image here really quickly just to um, illustrate the point of, of less than. Uh, this is an image that was on social media just recently. Um, so, so, and it takes us into the resilience space. So if I am the person feeling threatened um, because of the identity that I have chosen to assume or, or you know, that I have chosen uh, as my personal identity, and if I then take that and I feel threatened by somebody else who is different from me or who maybe identifies differently, and then I almost want to, um, to take away from that person because I feel as if they are taking away from me. I don't know if that makes sense. So, so, so if, we, if we move into the, the, the resilience space in the, within the context of diversity, 
this image here, in fact, I think if, if you don't mind, Lucille, I, I'd like to hear a few voices. Um, just anybody who wants to share thoughts about what message or what they see in this image from either a diversity perspective or both a diversity and resilience perspective. Just some voices in the room. Mm. So just unmute yourself if you want to make a contribution. Um. And maybe you can start, Lucille. You can mm. so take it off. Can I, can I <laughs> yeah. go? Yes, Lee, um, please go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly powerful. I, I feel very sort of triggered by it. Um, there's just, from her, I don't know if it's, I think it's a woman, from her perspective, I see such power, strength, but it's that gentle, it's just that uh, it comes from such a deep resilient space. I think for me, the story that she tells is, um, is so powerful. It's so much work that has been done and so much pain and trauma in life um, of, you know, around this. And his is a typical, typical, for me, threatened, scared, fearful person. And you can see that absolute, um, using my, my, my body, my strength, my height, my everything. Mm -hmm. There's something, um, although it doesn't seem it, for me, the strength is in her and not in him. It, mm -hmm. Though that's not what usually would be seen. Um, it's, it's an incredible image. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much mm -hmm. for that, Lee. And I think in many ways um, that touches on part of, part of what I see in that as well, is it's despite the aggressive body language, that's such a place, such an image that, that tells the story of white fragility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else absolutely. would like to... Mm -hmm. Anyone else who'd like to make a contribution? Just I'd unmute like yourself. To. Yeah, I'd like to make a contribution. I think no, just, in, just in the space of resilience, it's a, it's a, a picture that is, is quite triggering, as Lee said. Um, it's, it, it triggers you. And um, I know that um, part of resilience is um, self-mastery and the ability just to kind of manage our emotions and the intensity of our emotions. And so this is where what Sharon was saying earlier about inner healing being key to diversity. It really resonated with me, especially when you show a provocative picture like this, um, you know, just when you think you're doing well, and then you see a picture like this, yeah. and old, old emotions come back. You know, it could be, you know, trauma from home in terms of male figures and how they showed up. It could be, um, you know, the past of those of us that grew up in apartheid and just the fear of the police and, um, you know, and all of those emotions. So it's, it's a very provocative picture for us to just, you know, just look inside and see what still needs to be healed. Thank you. Um, hi, Thank you. it's when, yeah. in what Bianca said, um, very true um, in that you when when i look at that picture i see an abuse of power um, i see courage in the girl concerned um, in her standing her ground and not having run and and that pushes back against that power that he thinks he has which is why his hands are down by his side and not hitting her quite frankly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you Thank you very much. Mm, thank you. So, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Lucille. Thanks for facilitating that. Um, so, so this, this takes us to um, our understanding of resilience. And um, there's uh, somebody that I'd like to quote. Um, one of my most favorite authors. In fact, this is still my all-time most favorite book. You probably can't see it properly. I'm going to move it around in different angles. Um, so that the road less traveled. That's it, The Road Less Traveled by M. Scott Peck. And he starts off um, his teachings in, in this book with a very simple, very short, yet extremely powerful sentence. And that image that we've just seen 
um, gives life to, to, to the sentence. And the sentence is just three words. Life is difficult. Life is difficult. And, and the context of that book had very little to do with, or in fact, it had everything to do with, but it wasn't directly, obviously, to do with specific incidents, like, for example, what we've, we're seeing happening around us now. Um, but it just, it just shows you that, that not only is life difficult just in its nature, we actually then make it more difficult ourselves by constructing all of these things, and, and I don't like the word things, but sometimes I run out of words and I use the word things. <laughs> constructing all of these things that make it even more difficult. And when we do construct those things, we construct them thinking that it's going to actually make life easier for us. We want to, to simplify, and I suppose it takes us into a little bit the complexity space. We want to simplify systems and phenomena that are naturally complex in their nature. And, and there is nothing wrong with that complexity. It's, it's again, like we, what we said with the diversity, we need the complexity to actually have a richer experience of life. So instead of us wanting to oversimplify and construct all, all of these things that are supposedly you know, making this complex system less complex and, and, and simpler and easier to deal with, whatever. I mean, we, we, we genderize, you know, you're, you're a girl when you're born, so therefore you're going to become a woman and this is what it means. This is how you must breathe and walk and live and eat and talk and da 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 da, da. And by the way, dear woman gender or girl gender, remember, again, this is us constructing, right? Because we're simplifying so that life becomes nicer and easier, supposedly. Remember that, by the way, um, relative to this other gender over here, which is man, male, whatever, and this is what it means with the full prescription of it, remember that you are lesser, okay? So, yeah, and, and, we, and then we put a religion in there, you know, to say, yes, it must be like this because religion says, yes, it must be like this because whatever, because this, because that, and then we further uh, complicate our simplification process, <laughs> etc. And we do the same with race, right? We're like, oh yeah, by the way, dear human beings, there is a hierarchy, right? And we'll call it race. And we're going to base it on the color of your skin and all sorts of other things. And this is how it's going to work. We're going to have white at the top and then da 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 And remember, like we did with the gender, remember, by the way, that it is a hierarchy, okay? So if you are not up here, you are down here. So you are less than. Mm. Right, but let, let, I think I digress because we are talking about about resilience. But let's let's put it together this way. Now, imagine let's take the gender one just for for argument's sake. Imagine what this person who has been put here, i.e., the woman, the female, has to endure and withstand in terms of what they get coming from this side based on this constructed principle of gender inequality. Right. And what they have to withstand as we, there's, there is an aspect of that in that image, the gender aspect. What they then have to withstand because they are now not going to be given the same level of regard. They are not going to be um, enjoying the privileges of being male, <laughs> for example, that are constructed, right? So for them to have as full and meaningful a life experience as possible, they have to work hard and they have to withstand a lot which means that they need the skill of resilience that much more than the other gender which is their starting point their baseline is very different and so you take all of these other dimensions of diversity and the more you have to withstand because of how you are regarded as less than because of a variety of di uh, di di diversity dimensions, right? The more you actually are, find yourself in a position where for you to have a meaningful life experience, you have to work that much harder. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and Sharon, that's, that's in part what I've come across quite a lot is people that have to work to have that full experience because of where they are in these constructed hierarchies often 
I mean, that can be a source of great frustration and anger because I'm not only working on behalf of me, I'm also working on behalf of those of you at the top of the hierarchy um, in some way. So I'm having to do the emotional work. I'm having to do the resilience work. I'm having to do the systemic work. I'm having to hold so much. Mm -hmm. And it feels sometimes that I'm holding on behalf of those in privilege. And part of the privilege is that I don't have to do the emotional work, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so whether, whether, yeah, I don't know if that resonates at all mm -hmm. um, in, in some way. And I know that that's a source of, of deep anger that, that I've encountered in people to say, are you trying to put me in the position where I now not only have to work to have my full human experience, but also to help you have yours? I mean, mm -hmm. how much privilege do you really want to have going around here? Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to check in, Myrna, I know that you raised your hand at some point. Is there something that you want to add? I don't know if it's uh, relevant or if we've moved too far, but an invitation for you to add. Um, Lucille, I think we might have moved uh, uh, too far. It, it was basically something that I, uh, Sharon touched, touched on where she was kind of battling to explain the love element in the office, in, the, in business, which everyone has had a challenge with. And uh, I had an aha moment at one of the sessions at Worldview when somebody explained that the opposite of love is actually indifference. And, and that helped me understand how then, um, why it's so important that you have love. Because if you don't have the love in the workplace, you have indifference, which means you are not mindful. You don't look at the diverse perspectives. You don't see people as individuals. So I know it's completely off topic, but it was based on what she mentioned in the element of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And maybe they do link in some kind of way because that indifference yeah. um, is often part of privilege. Um, that analogy of the fish doesn't know the water it's swimming in. One of the mm -hmm. perspectives of privilege is that I don't realize how much privilege I have, I have and how much other people mm -hmm. have to work to just have a similar experience to me um, mm -hmm. in life. And so indifference even to privilege might be and my own privilege might be part of what keeps me from that love too um mm -hmm. sharon back and, over to you yeah thank you and, and lucille at, at some point uh, you you mentioned frustration right and part of the frustration which which manifests daily in the lives of you know these range of people who for a variety of reasons are treated as less than you know based on whatever dimension of diversity we, we're talking about. The added almost like um, expectation is that, you know, if I am um, a person living with a disability, just to keep it simple, I now have this added expectation to educate <laughs> the able-bodied people about my lived experience, you know? If I am a black person, who is at the receiving end of, of racism. I now have to educate the white person about that, you know, if, and, and even mental health. If I am somebody living with a, a, a depression or bipolar, whatever it might be, I have that battle to, to struggle through. At the same time, I now have to educate <laughs> these people who do not have uh, that challenge and, and, and it just adds to the frustration, but just bring it back to resilience and using the frustration uh, uh, aspect. Now, part of, of, of the understanding of resilience that, that I'd like people to have, and, and I have that understanding, it might be helpful, is that with these people who, as we are saying, in different ways and to different degrees, have to be dealing with this and, and needing to be more resilient than otherwise, um, if they learn how to reframe that frustration into an opportunity or, or be able to turn it into capacity to actually achieve something positive, achieve something constructive, achieve something that not only moves them forward, but moves everybody else around them forward as well, those who need to be moving forward with regard to whatever aspect of diversity we're talking about. There's a, a story that I actually um, 
haven't shared ever, which, which happened when I was in primary school. So it's a thousand years ago. It's, uh, we're not all beautiful and young, right? <laughs> or some of us. Uh, but it was um, this, this classmate of mine who was, she was, she was um, I think it's called quadriplegic, yeah? Because she, yo, she was severely disabled, let's put it that way. And she had, uh, you know, uh, uh, steel pieces that, oh, anyway, let's not yeah, describe it. But this girl, I mean, it's so many years later, but she has, her memory has, has stayed with me forever. She was the most confident, the most passionate, the most wholesome internally person that, that living with a dis disability that I've ever known. I mean, she, she, was, she was almost like a role model. <laughs> but that's because her inner world was at peace. Her inner world was healthy. She didn't feel threatened. She didn't feel less than. She could speak up for herself. She was amazing. And one of the things that I remember about her, which is strange that I should remember that, was that she was always neat and tidy and clean. She was just, and, 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 and what that says to me is how much it matters that we invest in our inner world and the well-being of our inner world and how also just coming back to resilience, how it is so very possible to learn how to reframe these frustrating experiences and to find in there the learning opportunity, the growth opportunity, and also the impact opportunity that you can actually, yes, have an impact and uh, take the world a step forward in how you uh, process your disadvantage, let's call it that. <laughs> um, yeah, and build your resilience. So the reframing is important. Mm, that's so beautiful. This, uh how important the, the conversation with our inner horizon is as we meet the outer horizon in the world in so many ways. And um, I was actually listening to, to uh, one of my favorite poets, a guy called David White over the, uh, yesterday on June the 16th. And he said something that really struck me as well. He said the opposite of incarnation and incarnation being that process of living, living diversity is abstraction. And abstraction can be both like taking myself out of, but also that process whereby my, my inner world becomes abstract and categorized in some way. And then I become an abstract version of the quadriplegic or an abstract version of whatever diversity aspect I might be um, speaking of. So this process of incarnating ourselves, of, of really cultivating our inner horizon so that we can so that we can be resilient uh, seems to be really, really important. And um, I know that the rest of his talk, he spoke a lot about that means that uh, we need to get used to the idea of our broken hearts because from that point onwards, you know, even, and that's part of resilient is to know that if we're going to care, not just about ourselves, but be in relationship with people, uh, the one thing that's absolutely inevitable is that we will get our hearts broken. <laughs> in this process and, and that in and of itself requires resilience. That's much more than this kind of pop psychology idea of resilience that's going around yeah. in, in <laughs> almost as a marketable um, commodity in some way. Um, uh, and resilience is so much more than just the three steps to uh, mm. from the perspective that you're speaking here, Sharon. Yeah, and, uh, and I laughed when you said pop psychology because the, the one thing that I personally don't like when I hear resilience being spoken about is this ability to bounce back, and bounce back. I always think of a tennis ball bouncing up and down. It's like, <laughs> ability to bounce back. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so it really takes away from um, what I see as the deeper and more meaningful meaning of resilience. Um, and, and one of the things that I started doing lately was to link it to another understanding and the understanding of tenacity. And, and that came up when I was looking at all of these definitions and understandings of resilience that I was finding all over the place that were just not enough. Um, and I thought to myself, okay, bounce back. What if you're bouncing back to a shape and form that's 
not your best and it's not ideal and it's not taking you forward, but you keep bouncing back into it anyway. <laughs> Surely we need more than that. Um, and, and that's when I, I came across the whole understanding of, of tenacity, because what that says to me is you're doing much, much more than bouncing back. So, so you are being resilient. And if you think back to that image again that we shared, you're being resilient, but in your resilience, you're doing more because you are growing, you are achieving, you are moving forward, you are growing your impact um, as, as a person, and, and you are you're doing all of that because you are purpose-driven. You have, you have an end in mind, which is very different from the current. So there's almost like a transformation process in that resilience. You are, I suppose you could even say you are transcending whatever it is that you keep coming across. Because remember, life is difficult, so challenges will always be there. And some are absolutely extreme beyond your wildest imagination. And, you know, they might not even knock before they enter in your life, um, either work-related or personal, it doesn't matter. You're still the same human being. And yes, so the question is, beyond bouncing back, in fact, let's not even think bounce back and rather think move forward despite the obstacles that are uh, 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 pulling you back, right? And tenacity for me says, I am purpose-driven and I am more than resilient. I am determined, I am persistent, and I have a purpose in mind and that's what I'm pursuing. And I get it right because I use all of these difficulties and challenges as learning opportunities. I reframe, I have learned how to take care of myself. I have learned to learn from these experiences and I build on as I move along in my life journey. I build on and as I'm building on, I become even more resilient and even more capable of not only coping, because we need to go way beyond coping and not only surviving, but thriving nonetheless, you see. Mm -hmm. So if you take that as resilience, now just back to that, example of let, let's take the, the, the gender hierarchy. It does not mean that this male privileged person over here does not have to also um, deal with challenges in life that are absolutely extreme, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So they also need, just by virtue of being a human being and living life, they also need that ability to become increasingly resilient as they travel through their life journey. So we need to recognize that as well. And I'm making this point because I don't want us to be stuck only on the other parts of the hierarchy, the lower levels of the hierarchy, and have this belief that it's only those people who are at the receiving end of, you know, whatever discrimination or whatever you want to call it, who need to be resilient. No. Resilience is, that is a skill that even without that, we still need anyway to be growing on an ongoing basis in order for us to do more than just survive through difficulties in life, but to thrive. Mm. One, mm. Of the, one of the interesting perspectives that maybe links to this um, is that if I am in a position of privilege and the system around me is changing to be more equal, the hierarchies are becoming squashed, um, what, what is in actual fact equality can feel like discrimination. And that requires a very complex set of, you know, responses and resilience to keep going. If all of a sudden I feel that I'm being discriminated against, where actually what I'm getting is some form of treatment that's closer to equal um, mm -hmm. that I've I've not received before now, uh, and that's definitely part of part of the stories and conversations that I'm hearing is um, it's almost like the need for all of us to recalibrate into a world where humanness is, is a more egalitarian concept than a hierarchical one. But that means that there, I mean, it's, it's not even about winners and losers. It means that everyone's adjusting because mm -hmm. no one's in that space where, where, um, where our treatment has and our experience of the world and what we've had to struggle with or not struggle with has been equal. Um, and that's beyond categories. That's for all of us as humans. If we all were to see each other and experience a more egalitarian worldview, we all have to give some things up and we all have to claim a certain agency and, and position 
uh, in relation to everyone else, which is a very tricky calibration to make. It's complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much so, Lucille. And, and, and the giving up is something that um, is not easy, especially where one has become accustomed to the benefits of that position of privilege. Um, so that's the one aspect. And it's also difficult to um, give up if one is not working from a position of we are all equal as human beings and deserve the same level of regard from a human dignity point of view. So, and yes, we've rephrased it at, at, at one point, we called it love, right? So if there is no love present, then, you know, that giving up is difficult. Um, if the giving up also involves um, me giving up um, almost like having to become vulnerable because of that giving up, again, I retreat to a place of safety and I'd much rather not give up. And this, this is what contributes a lot to us speaking about these things. And even on this platform, in this meeting, in this room right now, us engaging very deeply and speaking about all of these things. And then at the end of the meeting, we all go into our different spaces. And guess what we do? We continue as usual. And I'm not going to say as normal, because what's normal and <laughs> what's not normal. But we, we just continue as usual. And we, uh, again, find ourselves being um, at the mercy of whatever fears we had even before this discussion. We find ourselves um, being at the mercy of whatever deep-seated beliefs we had even before this engagement. So, so we just go back to, to the usual. And, and with the falling hierarchies, um, the usual then gets disturbed and the fears become that much more pronounced. So, so my, my defensive um, hiding, running away, retreating behavior becomes that much more pronounced, which is why it calls on us to consciously, actively, proactively, and courageously. We really need to be courageous about this. It takes a lot of courage even for um, the people who are at the receiving end of inequality based on whatever dimension of, of, of diversity. Even for those people, courage is needed there as well because it tends to be difficult for most to even speak up against the system, so to speak. So courage is needed at this end of the spectrum as well as at the other end of the spectrum where I feel threatened, my power is, 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 is being taken away, my privilege is being taken away, my easier lives, easier than relatively, is being taken away. That means that I will no longer have this, you know, awesome life experience. I'm afraid and therefore I'm going to hold on. So, so at both ends, uh, we actually need that courage in different ways for different reasons. Mm. Wow. Um, so this is a time of tenacity and courage. And, and if those sound like essential qualities that we, that we all need to embrace in some way. So if we want to, as individuals, cultivate our inner capacity for diversity, or as leaders, or as practitioners, as individuals, cultivate this capacity for, for inner diversity and if we want to help our organizations and our families and our teams and our communities to, to be more inclusive spaces of love, what can we do at this point in time, given that we, we are here in 2020, we no longer in 1995 or some other time, uh, we're in the reality and the complexity of 2020. Um, mm -hmm. What can we do at the level of practice or at the level of, of supporting change um, mm. that you so eloquently speak of, Sharon? Yeah. Look, um, Lucille, it's, first of all, it's not, it's not something that can be done overnight, right? It's not like you um, follow some recipe and you do step one, step two, step three. Yay, look at me. I'm now on step four. Phew, I'm you know, achieving success, this is really great. Um, it's, it's, it's not like that. Um, as, as we said earlier on, you know, life not, is not only difficult, but it's also very complex. It's a complex system, um, uh, which means that it doesn't have 
um, you know, linear relationships in it. Um, it doesn't have uh, direct and obvious cause and effect relationships uh, uh, in it. So, so we need to acknowledge that, um, that we, we, we're talking about very complex things here. And we ourselves as human beings are complex systems ourselves. Um, so, so it's not easy, even if you take it at just individual level, just taking the time to understand yourself, taking the time to know yourself and going through that learning process about yourself, which for me is the starting point. That in itself is a complex uh, process and it's not an overnight thing. Um, so, so you are going to need to, first of all, be very committed to that process. So if, if, there are, um, if there's a lack, you know, to whatever extent of commitment to actually seeing this through, then already it's compromised. So, so it requires, um, uh, first and foremost, commitment. You really need to want to do this. It, it's not something that you've got to be told by your company, your boss, your whatever. If, it, if that want does not come from within you, then already success is compromised to, to some extent. And post-commitment, say, yes, I do I sincerely want to do this. Uh, you need to know that it starts with you. It starts with that internal journey. Um, you have to take on the responsibility of self-introspection, examining your beliefs, examining where you're coming from. And I like the way that uh, D'Angelo put it when, when she spoke about, where did I write it down? Where she spoke about um, uh, the, the racism or the um, race-related privilege. And I don't know where I've written it down, but anyway. Uh, but she talks about um, you, for example, as a white person, right, examining how privilege might be serving you right now and how you might actually be perpetuating or um uh, God, i wish i could remember how she puts it <laughs> but anyway but but that self-examination and using that for illustration purposes examining how you might actually be enjoying white privilege and perpetuating white privilege and going within to find how you can actually reframe that and rework that and rewire that so that whatever beliefs that is associated with are questioned and almost like debunking myths for yourself. And you then reshape your beliefs and adopt a different set of beliefs that will serve your mission better. Remember, and I'm calling it mission because we started with commitment. So if there is a commitment, it's a personal mission for you. If it's not a personal mission, then it doesn't matter what your company does. I mean, there are obviously a whole range of interventions that companies can do. But if those things are happening to me as a member of that particular organization, and I could be at any level, I could actually even be the head of that organization. And I'm just going through, or I'm being taken through these experiences, but there is no personal commitment from within me, then there is just, there's no hope. So, so, so my, for me, the starting point is, Start with you and what's happening within you that is then leading to certain ways of being that are actually taking um, the, the, the whole transformation process backward. Mm. I mean, that's, that's very helpful, Sharon. And I mean, it, it reminds me of part of what uh, Robin D'Angelo also provokes in many ways and where, where she, she says um, that it's useful for, for people to consider meeting within affinity groups. Um, and with that, she says, white people have to speak to other white people about issues of white fragility and privilege and what that means for us, as opposed to continuing to just um, rely on our black colleagues to do the work for us. Um, and so there are many versions of that. And I know that we need to come together and be a part in these conversations in so many ways. But there is something of saying, you know, where have I outsourced my work in some way to other people that are already doing so much work um, that I need to do my own work and my own and, and find my own ways of confronting um, my beliefs and my values and, and how we all are in our own different ways part of the systemic problems um, mm. 
and that's that's an interesting and useful useful starting point yeah and and i think um lucille rather be the first person to call yourself out on a thought even before it becomes an action a thought or an emotion that you know is not actually serving the mission so be the first to call yourself out and then be that person who calls those who are closest to you out and this is in personal and private spaces even before we leave home be that person that calls your best friend out on them expressing a thought or an ideology or an emotion or whatever it might be or an action that is actually taking away from the mission of equal regard amongst one another as human beings as human equal human dignity right so so you can you can first of all become that kind of person who can has learned how to pick that up even as it arises within you and you can hear it you can feel it that it's taking the mission away i mean taking away from the mission and learn how to <laughs> rewire yourself privately even before the next person and that the best next persons are the people who are closest to you your family your friends mm. and sensitize them you know help them to learn and don't teach them by preaching to them teach them by being mm. let them experience you as that person who is changing <laughs> because the change has to be seen and felt and and let 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 you be the person who shows them and yes we have to talk to one another we have to teach that, that doesn't take that away let become that person who your family can learn from and see the their ways and and see see what is not serving us as a as a as a human community as 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 a human society as human kind what's not serving us let them learn from you and then we can take it out to whatever. I mean, the way that you are with your neighbor. Yeah. The way that you are with your neighbor. When, when I had new neighbors about uh, two years ago, um, a, a, a white family, and the way they treated me <laughs> in the first, gosh, in the first few weeks of them being here. My wow. Um, and what did I do? Of course, the first reaction was very angry, emotional. <laughs> and I said all sorts of things that shall not be said in this meeting. <laughs> I did that privately. I did that with friends and family because I needed to let out vent. It's part of the healing process. But because of my personal mission, for me, this work is, is not just, you know, um, professional, whatever. Because of my personal mission to do my bit before I um, say goodbye from planet Earth, um, I, I knew that I will do what I have committed to, which is to wipe that slate clean and give the relationship another chance. Mm. Mm. Long story short, we get along. Not only get along, we, we have a relationship, a meaningful relationship. Wow, Sharon, what a, what, a, what a gift you are. And I want to personally say thank you to you. As we, as we wrap this up, we've come to, to 10.30. I want to particularly honor you for being the kind of person who walks through this world with your heart where your feet are. Um, what a beautiful gift um, to really live that mission. And thank you for sharing some of your wisdom, some of your experiences in a way that is incredibly generous and speaks to the generosity of your spirit and your, your soul as well. Um, and I know that uh, those people on the call that are uh, interested in finding out more about the kind of work that you do uh, with World's View and also more about how to understand diversity and inclusion and resilience inside your organization and what we can offer in terms of the inclusion index and other ways of sur surveying that. Those of you that want to stay on the call, um, Please feel free to do so. We will we'll be on the call for the next couple of minutes as well. But Sharon, any any closing thoughts or words for you from your side as we bring this uh, very important session to a close today? Mm. Yeah, I think my, my closing 
thought, my closing message is that it's worth it. Um, that it's so, 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 so worth it. It's worth it to, to learn how to work through the pain, um, to work through the fears, to bite the bullet <laughs> and have the courage to be the bigger person regardless of what you're receiving from the other end. Um, and I just want to, if, if I may, I, I'd like to use this image again as I, as I share my, my, last, um, my last words. That looking at one another as human beings, if you're this man and you look into the eyes of that woman and you see yourself, you will be kinder, you will be more compassionate, you will be less afraid, you will be more open to learning about that person. And if you are this woman and you look into the eyes of this man and you see yourself, you will be more able to work through the pain, you will be more able to forgive regardless, you'll be more able to extend the olive branch, you'll be more able to engage. What these two people here, which represents even our boardrooms um, as we speak as at 2020 June. This is not just something that happens out in the street um, and it represents a number of dimensions of diversity, but there are many others. Um, if we invest in and I'm going to use a strange phrase, taking a very deep breath <laughs> and then engaging. A very, very deep breath. <laughs> a couple of them. <laughs> Breathing is massively powerful. <sighs> I needed that one. If we do that, wow, 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 wow. What we can achieve is amazing. It is absolutely amazing so we are taking the amazing away from ourselves let's stop doing that <laughs> that's my last little bit <laughs> thank you thank you thank you so much Sharon we are deeply grateful for your wisdom and your contribution today thanks thank you very much thank you for having me thank you everybody thank you thanks Great, so Liesl, Roy, back to you. And I don't know if you want to stop the recording here, but an opportunity for people to also just stay on the call for some Q&A um, and some conversation. And I know some of you have to go. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you everybody for making it today. <laughs>